From Minneapolis, Deputy Chair of the Democratic National Committee, Congressman Keith Ellison of Minnesota. Um, Congressman, I guess first of all, if you could respond uh, to the president's factually incorrect tweet this morning. Well, of course, it's ridiculous, but it's also a head fake. I mean, just last week, Jeff Sessions was found to have been uh, arguably lying to Congress regarding uh, his contacts with the Russian ambassador in the context of all types of strange and, un and unnerving connections with Russia. And he puts out this silly stuff, and now we're talking about it. I'm not critiquing you guys for talking about it. It's news. But it does, it does sort of shift the dialogue around the country when he puts out this absurd stuff about stuff that really is detrimental, damaging, and worrisome. And of course, uh, you know, this Muslim ban, which they insist is not a Muslim ban, although that's what he called it on the campaign trail, uh, is a hot issue. Uh, and so the, when he puts this stuff out, yeah. I agree that it's narcissistic and insecure. I also agree that it has the effect of changing the conversation. Mike Barnacle, then Kenny Kay. Mike? Congressman, uh, you are now number two in the DNC, trying to get the Democratic Party back on the uh, winning side of things nationally. That's how right. do you go about doing this? Uh, how do you go about getting, you know, a 42-year-old man with his 42-year-old wife and their two kids who live in suburban Minneapolis, who are maybe taking right. home in between 75 and 100 grand? How do you convince them that your party has not gone so far left that they are now their lives, their hopes, their dreams are in the rearview mirror? Well, that person, if they're living in suburban Minneapolis, they, they voted for me. I've won with 70% of the vote, and my turnout has been increasing every single year that I've been in office. So that person is not a problem. But let's just say somebody in Kentucky or Youngstown, Ohio, somewhere like that. Uh, we got to talk to them. We got to go to their doorstep. We got to listen to them. We got to ask them what they think is critical to improve the lives of, their, of them and their families. And then we've got to get people elected who are going to make sure that they're getting uh, their aspirations met through their elected representatives. I mean, the problem of the Democratic Party, I believe, is we become a presidential party, not necessarily a, you know, a, an everyday local government party, which we, Tom and I are absolutely committed to doing. And we become a four year, every four year party where we need to be an everyday party. So the real thing is we yeah. talk to everybody all over the country all the time. Caddy Kay. So one other problem, it seems to me, Congressman, with the Democratic Party is that it's pretty old. I mean, you're young and Tom Perez is a little <laughs> bit young. But if you look at the leadership of the Democratic Party in the House, the average age is, what, 75 of the top three leaders? The average age of the top three leaders in the Republican Party in the House is 45. That's a huge problem that the Democratic Party has just in trying to get a younger, more talented bench. What are you going to do about that? Well, what we're going to do is talk to the grassroots. We're going to engage the grassroots. We're going to get them voting, engaged, writing letters, seeing their members of Congress, pushing the issues that they feel are critical. And we believe that that will yield the kind of leadership that people really, really want. I will say that the leadership we have now is responsive. Nancy Pelosi has been on the front forefront of the, of the key issues. So has Chuck Schumer. Uh, and so I really don't think that their age matters in this thing. I think that they got a lot of experience, and I think that uh, they are pushing the issues that are issues that are critical. But our main goal is to is to engage the grassroots, make sure people feel listened to and heard. That will uh, solve our political problems. So, uh, Rick Stengel, the travel ban. Uh, let, let's move to to that if we can. It's very hard. This is getting harder and harder to cover policy when the president has lacks credibility on every level and, and appears to be lying or copying and pasting ridiculous facts <laughs> from Fox News tweets. But let's try our best. Tell me about the travel ban. What does it change? And how is it different from the first one? It does more narrowly tailor it than the first one. Um, it changes the words, but it doesn't change the music in the sense that people still look at it as a, as a Muslim ban. Mm -hmm. Had they you know, I might be a little bit renegade here. Had they actually proposed this originally, it wouldn't have caused the kerfluffle that, that it eventually did. Um, 
I think that it still has the same problems philosophically, which is that it, it has due process problems, it has First Amendment problems, uh, and it has problems of credibility in the sense that there has been no acts of terrorism from any refugee or visitor from any of these banned countries. I mean, so, so this, the Ninth Circuit can still look at it and say, well, you haven't justified it. Um, so uh, again, had they done this originally, I think it, it, it wouldn't have caused the furor that it did. Mm -hmm. But now everybody has this in mind and there's that uh, UN statement just below where people around the world, and there was a New York Times story, people around the world still see it the same way. Again, the only thing I'd say in, in favor is that people do see, at least our system seems to be working. Mm -hmm. A court, you know, overruled uh, an action of the president, the, the White House came back. Insofar as people look at that, let's hope they think, okay, we're still functioning. Keith Ellison, is is that uh, is that fair? Is that one positive little particle of this? Well, <clears throat> I guess you got to look for some glimmer of hope in an otherwise <laughs> dismal situation. Yeah. I mean, the fact is, this is a ban uh, that was originally designed to bar people because of their religion, and it is still that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't ban every Muslim in the world, but all the people who are banned are banned because they're Muslim. And look, if you look at the countries where people who have committed acts of terrorism in the United States actually come from, those, country, those, people are not, those countries are not on the list. It's an irrational list. It's a mean list. And let me just say this. In Minneapolis, we're very proud of our Somali-American community. This, they are making, starting businesses, running for office. Ilhan Omar, first mm -hmm. state legislator of Somali descent. And they're now, Somalia is now going through a massive drought and a famine. And these people could be banned from getting relief uh, from, through, through coming to the United States because of this ban. This is a rare, this is inhumane and it's cruel yeah. and it's wrong. Well, and, it, and, it, and I just, I just can't. Your description of it, Congressman, uh, irrational and mean, is matching the behavior that we're getting from this president on all other levels. Right. So it's incredibly disturbing. Uh, Congressman Keith Ellison, thank you. While making the case thank for you. suspending the... Thanks for checking out MSNBC on YouTube and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories and you can click on any of the videos around us to watch more for Morning Joe and MSNBC. Thanks so much for watching.